Oh, jeez, Doc. I saw a fox. No! Oh, my gosh. Oh. Oh, what hey, everyone. That? How's it going? My hey. name's Henry. Or Marty. Or whatever it is. <sighs> would you like some lemons? <laughs> my name is Life. <laughs> my, my. I would like some lemons, and I can make some lemonade. I don't understand. Why is Life giving us lemons? <laughs> hey, make lemonade. this week we're going to be looking at some really cool, uh, well, a really cool device called the Pi Voyager. It is perhaps the ultimate Raspberry Pi UPS. It's got a whole bunch of great features. We're going to be showing you that. Also, I'm going to show you how to solder headers to your PCB. Stick around. Help me. Recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters. Cat5.tv slash IAIB. Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. I don't know what to say. What do you say? Oh, geez, Doc. I don't know. I want to howl, but I'm like, no, that's not what oh. the fox says. Oh, 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 geez, Doc. I, did, I detect a reference <laughs> to something. Sorry. And, and what is this? What? Oh! Uh, what would have you, you brought us? Would you like some lemons? Mm. What, 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 one can say that life gives you lemons. When life gives you lemons. Ah. <laughs> well, welcome to the show, everybody. I apologize that my microphone sounds a little bit horrible because I am inside this, <laughs> this head. <laughs> it's like being inside of my head. Um, hey, this is, uh, we've got a really fun show planned for you. It is, of course, our Halloween special. Every year we, uh, we do this. And uh, we've got some great things planned for you, including we're going to be doing some soldering. We're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be looking at the Raspberry Pi. Yes. And are you ready for this? Marty McFly. The totally ultimate ready. battery backup for Raspberry Pi. Whoa. Awesome. Whoa. A fox just gave me amazing news. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> it's going to be awesome, everybody. Now, also, this is the first five week uh, month of season 13. Correct. Yes. And with season 13, the fifth Wednesday of every, uh, every month is Prize Wednesday. So the fifth Wednesday. Oh, so that's a rare and fabulous. Ooh occasion yes. yes so you've got a chance to win a prize this week uh, you want to stick around for all the details on how you can participate in that before we get into it though folks i want to remind you please subscribe to us on youtube and click that little bell and that's going to allow you to get notifications anytime we are live or when we post new and exciting videos it's really hard to breathe oh my gosh <laughs> oh my gosh oh, i think but i'm gonna die but your costume is epic. It is. This awesome. is true. It is really the winner. Everybody, take a, take a screenshot now because I don't know if I'm going to make it to the end of the show. Oh, no. I have to talk and breathe oh, no. <laughs> for over an hour. Yeah. Mine's really comfortable. I oh yeah. Say. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll tell you what. Um, for those of you who are interested in participating in our draw. Um, you know what? I'm just going to fade to black. I'm going to come back because I need to grab. I don't see. Oh, here it is. <laughs> no, I'm not going to fade to black. Don't worry about it. He's already hallucinating. Like, yeah, exactly. Um, and so you saw me use this last week. It is a Raspberry Pi wireless keyboard. I call it a Raspberry Pi wireless keyboard, but really it works nice. with any device, uh, whether, whether it's your Android TV box or uh, any single board computer. It's wireless, not Bluetooth. That means it has a wireless dongle that plugs into the USB, oh. which means you can use it 
immediately. It, yeah, regardless of setting anything up. It just works. We're giving one of these away. All you have to do is get into our Discord live. If you're watching live, check out, uh, you'll see prize week and uh, all you have to do is go in there and let us know where you're watching from and you're going to be entered now it's it's open to the first 14 entrants oh just 14 of you so your chances of winning this keyboard is one in 14. yeah and gotta go, go guys we're going to be drawing that in about 15 minutes' time, so stick around. Uh, okay, so I'm going to get over to our uh, unboxing table. And Ooh. what we're doing this week is I'm going to be showing you how to solder headers onto a PCB. Oh, Ooh. excellent. And <laughs> it's, ne it's needed because um, sometimes when you order a PCB, mm -hmm. it, um, it comes with the headers separated from the circuit board itself. Right. Oh. So whether it's an Arduino part or whatever it is, yeah. you may need to do a little bit of soldering. So we're going to look right. at how to properly do that. Nice. Um, and for that, I'm going to have to head over to our, uh, our special table over here where I've got some soldering equipment set up. What I have here on my soldering station, there's a couple of things that you absolutely need. Of course, we're going to need some solder. Uh, this is lead-free solder, electronic solder that I'm using. And I really recommend that you just grab one of these from the dollar store. It's just like a wire mesh uh, for cleaning, but it's great for cleaning the tip of your hot soldering iron. If you get some solder on there, you're going to uh, be able to clean that off really, really easily. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you're going to need a soldering iron as well, which I've got heating up right now. And what happens is we end up with uh, a, a PCB. Now, I'm using just a blank PCB prototyping board for the sake of the demonstration. Um, but you're going to end up with things like uh, circuit boards that you have to be able to solder the headers onto. And it can be really, really tricky. I mean, you can try to use helping hands and put that on there. But, you know, what do you, what do, you do? Like, it's all wobbly. It's going to fall all over the place. And it's really, really hard. And that, so then you try to hold it. And you're trying to hold solder. And and you're trying to solder it like this and you're burning yourself <laughs> oh and it's, no. it's just a mess. So my little tip for you here and one of my little tricks is to grab yourself a pack like this. Uh -huh. And this box is just a box full, which you're never going to be able to close. I'm going to tell you what, once you've bought it and opened it, you're never going to be able to close it again. It just comes with a whole bunch of prototyping boards. It comes with some headers. And these are great for like just to add to your kit anyways. But what you can do with that is grab a little bit of glue and glue a header onto your circuit board and then solder the other edge, uh, the, the back end. And then uh, do the opposite header. So we've got two types of headers here. We've got a female and a male. Okay, so I've put them on there like this for a reason. So this... Now it just looks like a useless PCB, but it's in fact a really great tool for me to solder headers. So now if we were to pretend that I, I've got a circuit board here that has arrived in the mail that I've ordered off of wherever, off of Amazon or wherever I've ordered my PCB from, and it came with, let's say, this header here. This is pretty common. So we've got this, this header that is going to allow me to plug this into uh, whatever else or maybe it's got a raspberry pi header that's going to allow me to put this onto a raspberry pi so well how do i solder that on so my little trick here with my board that i've created which is a very very helpful tool i'm going to take a header like this and plug it in then i'm going to take a header like this and plug it in and what that does is it gives me a stable place to be able to do my soldering. So now I've got my circuit board and remember what we're actually soldering on here is this guy. Okay, so in this particular example, and this is just an example, okay, uh, I'm going to plug this into my header and now I've got a nice solid place to put my board. The reason that I've placed this here too is because, and the reason that I've got this soldered on here is because now I've got a stable standoff to be able to put my PCB on so that it's not going to wobble, all right? So it's a little bit of a hacky little trick, but now when I put my PCB on, let's, let's do something crazy. Let's put it on like this, and we're going to pretend that that's the way that this particular PCB is going to go. So you see what I've done is I've actually put the headers on here, 
so that I so that they're sticking out and these headers are also sticking out of the board maybe they won't be and you can adjust that as needed but it's basically just giving me something to stand it on so that it's going to sit nice and solid so now with that on there I don't have to monkey with any glue or anything like that I can just kind of put something up against it and it gives nice support so now all I have to do is we're going to heat up the what I'm going to do, because I'm right-handed, I'm going to be going from left to right. The reason I want to do that is if I start on the right, I'm going to be moving left, and I'm going to be still heating up these joints on the right. Mm -hmm. I want to move from my left to my right because I'm right-handed. If you're left-handed, you're going to do the exact opposite. My soldering iron is good and hot. I've got it set to 400 degrees Celsius right now. So I'm going to start on my left-hand side, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch the kind of where the PCB meets the, uh, the pin, and I'm not using flux here today, but you may want to use flux if this is a electronics PCB, um, if, if you think it's needed. It's not always needed. In this case, we, we don't really need it uh, because we're going to be very, very quick. And part of this is being quick. So I want to get this in here and I want to touch it in there to get heat to the joint and then very quickly touch my solder and then lift up. Okay, so that creates a really nice joint right there. So now this is connected to that header. Now I'm going to move to the next one, heat it up, put the solder in there right at the corner where it's touching, and lift up. And now I've got a really nice joint right there next to it. I'm going to do the same over here. This is why we don't need flux. I'm not going to be touching here for any longer. Now my solder got stuck there. You see what happened? Oh, yeah. I'm mm. bringing that now back into the camera. So, oh, no. so you, did you see how I very quickly got my soldering iron out of there? Because I don't want to damage the board. I don't want to oxidize it or cause any problems. So now I've got mm. this problem where I've got this solder stuck to it. So all I need to do is just really quickly, now that it's cooled, I'm going to just touch there and bring that solder out of there. Ah. Oh, nice. And now start again. And get it in there. And boom. And what I'm doing is I'm lifting up to be able to get an, a really nice soldering joint there. All right, so now I'm going to grab here. Again, touching the corner where, they, where the two surfaces meet and bringing my solder in and lift. Final joint, heating it up just a little bit for just a couple of seconds and lift. And now I'm going to get in here and show you the joints. Oh. Where are they? Where are we? Here we so go. Get closer, closer. Oh, uh, and focus. Nice. Oh, nice. So there you go. So you do have some really good contacts. So you see how these ones I've not soldered. These are just standoffs just for support. So now when I lift this off, now my headers are perfectly attached wow. to no this PCB. Okay. So this is just a great little tool to create and use. And then I'm going to be able to solder these a lot more easily. Mm -hmm. Huh. Real quick, no flux necessary in this particular case. If now I might have wanted some flux because I got a little bit hot on the one joint there, uh, but uh, as long as you're careful, you should be okay. Uh, if you do need a little bit of flux, so if, if you're finding that, hey, maybe that joint uh, was getting a little bit too hot, I could add a little bit of flux to that just because my solder uh, is a flux resin core. Uh, rosin core. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help things there. So there you go. That is Super Looks cool. Good. Nice and solid? Yes. Nice. All right. So the reason I show you that mm -hmm. is we're going to be looking at a Pi Voyager. I have it right here. It's all set up and ready to go. Oh. And this is, there it is. Wow. This is something where, okay, so this one arrives and you've got to solder 40 joints. <laughs> okay. We're going to be looking at this right after the break. Stick around. Story 5 Technology TV. You guys should be doing all the talking because this is like really echoey in here. What? <laughs> <laughs> we have this guy to give away. These are wireless keyboards that can be used for your Android TV, for your uh, anything with USB. So Raspberry Pi, it's perfect. Any single board computer, it's absolutely perfect. You don't have to configure anything. You just plug in the USB dongle and go. So we've got our prize wheel here from Category 5 TV. 
Here we go. Okay, so who do we have? Bob K. 54. We've got Dennis Kelly, Noman 5. Sasha, you read for me. Solbu, R.D. Blair, G Dog. Yeah, G Dog. Yeah. G. Is that Swee SG Swiss? Sure. So, yeah. yeah. Swissig. Swissig. Albuquerque Turkey, Skyrider 64, F King, Ronnie Cat, Bob. Oh, did we, did we do Bob yet? Yeah, we're okay, right we're around. The way. It's, yeah, it's, we've come full it's, circle now. It's a circle. Yeah. Yeah, we got it. So this is our first time doing uh, Prize Week here on Category 5 TV. So if we're ready. Oh, we got another one? Yes. Excellent. Who we got? Guess 5850. All right. Where are you watching from? Um, Austin, Texas. Nice. 5850. Austin, which I might spell wrong, Texas. All right, there so we've we got go. one wild card. Nice. Here we go, here we go. Here we go. The fox. Oh, jeez. The fox. <laughs> Is he? Am I knocking things over? Oh, Ready? You're like a cat playing with And here we go. So where this lands, you're going to win. Sasha, hold it up for us. What do we have? Okay, we have this keyboard. Nice. It's a wireless keyboard. Perfect for your single board computer needs. And here we go. I'll give a one big spin. Where? Albuquerque. There we go. Congratulations. All you have to do, Albuquerque Turkey, is send us your mailing address and we're going to get that sent to you very, very soon. Congratulations. Nice. There we go. And now, the <laughs> next time there's a fifth Wednesday in the month, yeah. oh, we shall have another. It's coming back. Exactly. So that's how Prize Week works here at Category 5 TV. If you'd like to win, all you have to do is be here for the fifth Wednesday of every single month. Well, where there is five Wednesdays. Right. Sometimes there's only four. Mostly. So look at your wow. calendar. If you see five Wednesdays, be there. We're here. For it also Prize Week. Yeah. means that it's a three pay. Uh, month for me, whenever there's a fifth. Oh, there oh. you go. <laughs> <laughs> now we so know. Just perfect. Just now. <laughs> so you can pay for the prizes that we're there sending. There we go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, so we're going to take a look at the Pi Voyager. I'm going to strip off this mask <laughs> so that I can breathe, so that I can speak, and so that I can actually show you this amazing device. I'm going to head over to the table, and Sasha, if you want to... Okay. All right. Do this unboxing table. Bam. And now I can breathe. Transition. Yes. I can speak properly. Nice. All right. So this is the Pi Voyager. So what I've done is I've done the soldering joints for the 40 pin on the Raspberry Pi. And uh, and incidentally, I had to also adapt my battery. Uh, but this battery. Okay, so let's just kind of think about what this is. This is a, uh, a UPS for your Raspberry Pi. So that's battery backup. So. My Raspberry Pi right now, you can see, is powered on. You guys mm -hmm. can see that? Yes. yes. If I unplug the USB power from this, mm -hmm. my, <gasps> my Raspberry Pi is still pa powered on. Yes. Excellent. Plug that back in. <laughs> So my, uh, so this is much more affordable than any UPS that I've found and in fact has a lot uh, more features. It is uh, I squared C compatible. So it has some capabilities here like uh, being able to communicate with the Raspberry Pi through I squared C so that you can set up programs to be able to do certain things whenever the power goes out or when the battery is, uh, is low or whatever you want to do. Um, so I mentioned that I, had to, uh, uh, that I had to do some soldering for my battery. Now what this is, I bought this battery, this is 33,000 uh, 3, uh, milliamp hours, 3.7 volts. So I just picked this up off the internet and the, uh, the pin here for the uh, connector was incorrect. So I needed to get a JST connector for two millimeters because the one that was connected to my battery um, by default was uh, a 1.2 millimeter. So keep that in mind. You need either one, uh, two millimeter in order to connect it directly, or you could solder it directly to the board. There's extra headers there. Uh, in my case, I wanted to be able to unplug it and plug it in really quickly. So I simply spliced here and the polarity was different. So you see how I go from black to red, from red to black it's because the polarity was different. Uh, I actually have where you see black going into the, the Pi Voyager is positive, even though it is a black cable. It's coming off the red off the battery. So I mentioned that this is a 3000 milliamp hour battery, 3.7 volts that I got from, uh, I actually bought this one from Hard Kernel. They were blowing them out for a dollar. 
a dollar. Holy. Wow. And, the, and, and so you can get batteries quite cheap, uh, and it doesn't come with the Pi Voyager. The Pi Voyager comes in two parts. You get the circuit board, the PCB, and you get the headers. Uh, of course, Category 5 TV has uh, a tutorial for how to solder headers, uh, which could be very helpful for you if you need to be able to solder that on. And that's what connects it to your Raspberry Pi. So you'll notice my Raspberry Pi is not connected to uh, power on mm -hmm. the board itself. Mm -hmm. The power is coming in through the GPIO, through the Pi Voyager, and is powering that. I've got a little uh, button here that I can program to do whatever, like powering off or powering on or suspending, things like that. I've got a couple of LEDs here. I can see that the, uh, the power is currently good, which means, so PG means power good, which means the USB is providing five volts power to the Pi Voyager. The blinking light that you see there under CH, that means that it is currently charging my LiPo battery. Battery. That's okay. uh, lithium polymer. So that battery that is connected, the one that I, I changed the cable on, that is currently being charged. Hmm. And uh, well, Can I ask you, once that's yeah. fully charged, how long it would last? How long it will last? Hours, yeah. Sasha. Oh, hours upon hours. Okay. So Never. <laughs> now I'm going to jump over. So you guys have seen enough. I mean, it, there's not a lot to see here um, that you can't see on their website. Uh, and of course, you can get one of these at cat5.tv slash pi voyager. Um, I'm going to jump onto the camera uh, without my mask, uh, okay. even though this is the Halloween special, just so that I can, so that I can so talk. So you can so talk what, and breathe? Yeah. yeah. So what okay, I did, here. Sasha, what I did is I... Um, I Charged it overnight, yeah, and then I unplugged it this morning and left it in my van. Oh. And I checked on it every couple of hours, and it was still powered on. That's awesome. Oh. And <laughs> now, when I left work at, so I, I started it uh, on the battery at 7 a.m. Yeah. Okay. When I left work at 3:30 p.m., mm -hmm. it was off. It had powered off. Okay. So somewhere in between there, but like mm -hmm. probably in the last couple of hours of the day. Okay. Um, so I got several hours of battery time. So more wow. than enough. Oh, yeah. And it was more quite than enough. cold today, right? So would that yeah, affect I don't, it? Well, technically, cold technically, but not really. It technically dampens batteries. Yeah, right? but it, realistically, mm -hmm. though, um, what I need out of, my, um, out of my battery backup for my Raspberry Pi, really what I need is one thing, Henry. What do you need? I need it. I need my Raspberry Pi to stop frying SD cards. Right. That's, that's exactly kind of important. What you need because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's something that's kind of costly. That happens. Raspberry Pi are known if there are power situations like power brownouts mm -hmm. or if your power adapter doesn't provide full voltage all the time. Yeah. It will fry the SD card. And, and that's yeah. just a, that's a problem with Raspberry Pis, and it's mm -hmm. something that we all come to ex expect and accept with a Raspberry Pi microcomputer, but realistically... You don't have to. Yeah, I just don't yeah. want that. I don't want to be discarding what would have been a, a good SD card, and plus expensive. you don't want to lose data. Oh, it, yeah, totally. They're super cheap, Henry. I mean, like, I can buy a... a Not a, after 20 times. I'm no, I know. <laughs> but, like, a 16-gig Kingston card yeah. is, like, 5 to $8 on Amazon... Mm -hmm. Canadian, so that's yeah. like you know that's not much. So, um, but but really, I mean, it's like why am I d <laughs> discarding SD cards and why am I potentially losing data? That's mm -hmm. what I require. I want consistent power. So mm -hmm. when I unplug the Raspberry Pi, I want it to keep going. Mm -hmm. I want it to keep operating. But imagine this: so mm -hmm. I can I can have my little Raspberry Pi working, yeah, and then I can unplug it and take it somewhere else and plug it in there. And it never goes down between point right. A and point B. That'd be or awesome. Or <laughs> for a weather station that is powered by solar, for example, you've got power constantly to True. the Raspberry Pi, whether or not you've got power coming off of the, uh, the solar panels. Right. So there's all kinds of benefits to this. But oh, yeah. for me personally, it's like just in my server room where my Raspberry Pi resides, I want that consistent power mm -hmm. so that I'm not burning through mm -hmm. um, those SD cards. So a couple of quick points about this. I mean, I consider mm -hmm. this probably the best UPS that you can get for a Raspberry Pi. A couple of reasons for that. One, mm -hmm. it's more affordable. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I would weigh as 
what makes it the best. But when you consider that it is more affordable yeah. than the competition, if you will, the, the other products that are on the market, uh, and then consider that it has the I squared C, it also has GPIO nice. um, watchdog as well. Uh, and I'm going to be showing you a little bit about that. It has mm -hmm. safe shutdown triggering based on the programming. So it will actually at 3.1 volts. So if the battery drops mm -hmm. below 3.1 volts or somewhere around there, because normally it's about 3.3 and it up, it, uh, uh, it brings it up to 5 volts to be able to power the Pi. Yeah. But if the battery drops to 3.1 or below, or, or below 3.1, it will actually do a safe shutdown if you code it to do so. Oh, wow. Because okay. remember, it's programmable. Yeah. So then it doesn't fry so your So there charge. we go. Yeah, so it's not like it just suddenly kills the power. Yes, it will, oh. uh, but you can add programming to say, okay, let's just, like, I'll just explain how this works. Mm -hmm. So when the Pi Voyager detects that it has dropped below 3.1 volts, so basically mm -hmm. it's saying the battery is no longer powerful enough or has enough charge yeah. to power a Raspberry Pi at 5 volts. So at mm -hmm. this point, it starts counting down from 60 seconds. Oh. Once it reaches zero, it will kill the power unless within that 60 seconds you have a script running which you would yeah that oh. says okay save my work send me an email that says that the power's off oh. also ready for this set a, a watchdog a, um, alarm to automatically power back on the raspberry pi once power comes back to the usb uh. and oh. then do a safe shutdown Nice. So I can actually yeah. sequence those, code those into my script so that it will do all of those things. And a little nice. robotic voice will say, initiating. <laughs> you, yeah. can, you can do that. Just yeah. post. <laughs> so with the Pi Voyager, yes, it's completely programmable. And being I squared C, it communicates back with the Raspberry Pi. So awesome. And you can decide how you want it to behave. That is fabulous. Yeah. Wow. Should, I, should I jump over to my computer? I want to jump over here yeah. so that I can kind of show you how things look. So uh, let's get on there. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to go, um, well, let's, first of all, I need to set up the software, right? Yeah. That's square one. I, need, I know that the hardware is connected here. Uh, let's get the software installed. So I need to go curl. So apt install curl if you don't already have it. Curl dash capital O for output this file HTTPS colon slash slash www.omslow.com slash downloads slash pi voyager dot tar dot gz so what I'm actually downloading is the program that's going to allow me to communicate through I, I squared C with that board so let's untar that file there we go so now I have a file called Hi Voyager, and if I run it with the command status, it's going to show me that, hey, it's currently power good, mm -hmm. PG. We already learned that one. All right. And it is currently charging, mm -hmm. and we're, the battery is sitting at uh, 4.16 volts. So what I want to do now is I want to actually put that in my path so that I never have a problem with this. So now I've downloaded it to my temp folder. I want to actually move that file, Pi Voyager, and we're going to put that into my path in, say, user local bin. And I'm going to force that because I know it's already there because I already installed it to test earlier. So there we go. So now, no matter where I am, if I type Pi Voyager status, I can see that state. Excellent. Right? So, so it's currently charging. Now, watch mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So I'm going to actually run this in watch. So there you go. You see how it's currently charging? Okay. I want you to tell me, now, as I walk over to the yes. Pi Voyager, mm -hmm. I'm going to... And Sasha, can you change to the overhead camera here for a second? I can, certainly. All right. Transition. So now you can see, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to pull this cable mm -hmm. from the Pi Voyager. Okay, okay. switch back to... Uh, to oh, the uh, to laptop, laptop close. There we go. Yeah, to go oh, there. laptop close. Yeah. close. There we okay. go. Ah, now, there I'm going to pull are. it. Three, two, one, pull. And, and watch what happens. Oh, See that? It's charging. It's actually discharging. So fancy. That is awesome. But remember, I'm still communicating with the Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So, Henry, if you push Control C on my laptop, it's which C. is going to. Control C. There, there you go. So you're actually. See, you're still on the Pi. But, Sasha, switch back okay. to the uh, overhead camera. I'm really making them work tonight. Notice <laughs> I'm powering this. Not from USB. There's no power going to the right. to this device. It's from the battery. Yeah. Ah. Let's uh, let's unplug the HDMI. Okay. So I have 
two things plugged into my Raspberry Pi right now. Mm -hmm. I have a battery yes. into the Pi Voyager. The Pi Voyager is, of course, plugged into the GPIO, and I just ha simply have Ethernet. And okay. Henry, if you switch back to uh, Laptop Close, you're going to see, if you type like LS, but you're going to see LS. that yeah, it's responding. Yeah. There you go. Hit enter. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Yes. Okay. Yeah. See? Yeah, I can still navigate around. All right. So now t uh, press the up arrow to bring it back to the watch. Press up arrow again a couple times until Come you on. see. There you go. Enter. There you go. Now I'm going to plug back in the power to my Pi Voyager. Here we go. Three, two. And if I can line it up, one, it's in. There we go. Charging. Now it Perfect. says it immediately switches to charging mode. Mm -hmm. So because we know that it's communicating yeah. and it's responding with this information, now mm. we can program it to do things. Right. Oh, How do we okay. want it to respond to these things? So if you head over to their website, I'm going to jump back to my laptop here. All right. Let's jump onto Chrome. And I'm, again, I'm going to have all these links for you, so check the description below if you're watching this online. Okay. Uh, otherwise, go to our website, category5.tv, and you'll be able to pick up on all that stuff. So I'm going to actually go to omslow.com slash, and it is at articles slash pi voyager dash installation and <laughs> tutorial. If I typed all that right, mm -hmm. there we go. We're there. So here, you're going to see a couple of... Can we switch over to it? Oh, you... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please about do. I about to say, <laughs> wait a minute. There we there go. There we are. <laughs> she, she keeps me in check, folks. There you go. There you go. So I'm there. Um, and here, we've got some information there and, and some of the things that we've been through. Mm -hmm. However, if you scroll down a little bit here, Henry, you see this script here as an example. See how simply this can be done. So if oh, I just wow. zoom in a little bit here to show you, mm -hmm. and I'm going to bring this over for you. There we go. There. So all this is, is it's a loop. So while true, do this. And we're going to check Pi Voyager status flags. And we're looking for what? PG. What's that stand for? Uh, power. Power. Good. Good. Yes. Power good. Well done. So with power good, it's going to do what? It's going to sleep for five seconds. It's going to do nothing. It's just going to sit there. Okay. And it's just going to, and it's actually going to keep doing that because this is a loop. So mm -hmm. it, as long as power is good, it's just going to keep looping. Nice. However, the UPS script continues on. So mm -hmm. the only time it's going to break out of that loop is if power is not good because right. grep is going to uh. say, no, this didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So then it's going to break out of here and it's going to say, we are now running on battery, save your work, and we'll initiate a shutdown in 30 seconds. Then it sleeps for 30 seconds. It waits. Mm -hmm. It gives time for you to be able to shut things down. And then it shuts down the power unless power becomes good again within yes. those 30 seconds. So if power becomes good, it will say, oh, no, power is good again. So we'll just break and return to our original loop. However, if power did not come good, it's going to go, uh, oh, no, oh, no, this is, power pardon me, was power restored. was restored. Yep. If it did not uh, get restored, then it's going to break out of this loop. Mm -hmm. And it's going to say, okay, what is it going to do? Yep. Check this out. This is what's so cool. And I just want to show you this real quick before we get into coding this for you. Pi Voyager, this is the executable that we just created. Mm -hmm. uh, enable power wake up. So wake up after the power comes good from USB. Mm -hmm. So if, so we're going to shut down now, but if power comes back on, mm -hmm. turn back on again. Good. That's all part of this device. Next step. Watchdog 25. What that means is, okay, the Pi Voyager is going to do something unique. Mm -hmm. When you turn off your Raspberry Pi normally, mm -hmm. it's still trickle-pulling electricity. Yeah. It's still wasting electricity. Mm -hmm. There's still a draw there. Mm -hmm. The Pi Voyager, however, with this Watchdog 25, will say, after 25 seconds, so mm -hmm. remember, 30 seconds has already gone by. Yes. After another 25 seconds, regardless of what happens, I'm going to kill all all power to the Raspberry Pi. Okay. That means we're going to be using zero. Nothing is going to be used by the Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. Now, presumably, if USB comes back on, it's going to start charging the battery, yes. and the, um, mm -hmm. the software-enabled power-wake-up is going to wake it back up again, and then we're going to start drawing again. Nice. But as it is, it's going to kill all the power so that it's not drawing from the battery at that point. Right. Right? Makes there sense. There you go. Yes. And then the next step, the final step in this particular sample script mm -hmm. is shut down now. So what that does is it safely 
powers off the Raspberry Pi. Nice. So power's been out for, you know, a couple of hours. The battery has depleted to 3.1 volts. Mm -hmm. And it says, okay, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to tell it to wake up when power comes back. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell it to automatically power off all power after the next 25 seconds. But I'm going to turn it off now, safely. Yes. Nice. No micro SD cards were hurt yes. in the creation of this oh. script. All right. Oh. Uh. All right. So jumping back to my laptop here, I'm going to head over to my own GitHub, github.com slash cat5tv slash, and forget about the, I'm pushing backspace a bunch of times. Look at the, uh, <laughs> the address bar instead, cat5.tv slash, let's bring this down here for you, uh, Pi Voyager. And in the Pi Voyager repository, you'll see that I have uh, an examples folder. And within the examples folder, there's one called statemon as an example. So let's bring up the raw script there so that I can copy this to my, to my Raspberry Pi. Um, so I've copied the URL to that statemon uh, program. Uh, let's go into my temp folder just, just for kicks for now. I can put this anywhere that I want, but let's wget that uh, from GitHub. And then I'm going to make it executable. And then run it. And what does it say? Same kind of thing. It's, it's just like watch. It's saying, hey, currently we're, we're powered, uh, we're running on USB. Mm -hmm. uh, and the battery is charging. Now, if I pull that cable again, so this is... And I want to show you this. It looks like it's the same thing, but it's not. I'm going to pull the, batter, uh, the USB. So now it's been pulled. Mm -hmm. And now my script is running every five seconds. There you go. Mm -hmm. So now it says that it has changed to battery. Yep. And it's, this is the current state. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to plug it back in. And it's going to switch to USB. And it's going to say that it's charging. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it's going to say fully charged. It's done. Yeah. And it's finished. Well, okay. Right. So it actually okay. lets you know. That's nice. Well, that script will. So, and this is why I wanted to, to just demonstrate this particular script, because we're not just watching the status. Yeah. This is an actual program that I've quickly written just to give you a little bit of a, a sample. So let's open that up. So this is Statemon from the repository. Mm -hmm. So you see a couple of things really, really quick. First of all, I've created a quick check state function, so I can run that anytime. Whoop, there we go. Mm -hmm. There it is. Check state simply grabs Pi Voyager status flags and checks for power good. If power is good, which means USB is powering it, the state is USB. If not, the state is battery. Okay, and it's going to return that. Um, and then if the now old state, don't worry about it. It simply this prevents it from outputting every five seconds. Mm. So what matters to you? Scrolling down a little ways here, if the state is USB. Then, here's what we want to know. Check the sta uh, status of the battery. And if the status changes, run this. So if we're on power right now, we want to do these things. So uh, let's put in echo hello there. <laughs> okay. This could be um, send me an email that power is back. Mm. This can be any command that I want. This can be send a notification to my NEMS server. This can be send something to the log that says power is back online. But I like the idea of an email that's going to let me know. Mm -hmm. Now, if I go back down to here, notice I've added some comments here. Place your commands within this. This is when um, it switches to battery mode. Mm -hmm. So echo, uh, hello, this is on battery. Just pretend, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's send, uh, send an email. Okay, so anything that I put in here, it's going to do. So if I, if I do a mail command and send an actual email in that moment, it will happen. So now if I run that, here's Statemon, okay? Mm -hmm. Now if I jump back here, and I'm going to unplug that, and the state is going to change. Here we go, three, okay. two, one. And it's got a five-second timer. And so see how it says, yeah. hello, this is on battery, let's send an email. So mm -hmm. what I have done there is I've added something to the, the functionality of this board. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just with a simple quick line. There you go. Plug it back in. And then. USB is in now. And there, there we, we go. go. And you hello see how there. it says, yeah. <laughs> so it says hello there. Nice. So 
whatever you want to program in, yeah. it can become a part of this UPS. That's incredible. So that's you awesome. set that up as a script that's always running and whatever you need to do, I think it's a great idea to set up a safe shutdown sequence, mm -hmm. notify your administrators, mm -hmm. those kinds of things if it's a server, uh, and, and shut down whatever tasks or unmount iSCSI volumes so that you don't have corrupt files. True. All those kinds of things can happen in this script. And that's just a sample. Just right. a really, really quick sample. So just finally, um, when you have that, so type pi voyager help. This is going to give you all the commands that are available to you, and any of these can be added into your program. So alarm, clear, date. I haven't even touched on some of the features of this. It's amazing. Oh, it adds a real-time clock to your Raspberry Pi. No. One of the other failings of the Raspberry Pi is there's no RTC. Right. Oh. So now you have one. It's right built there. in. <laughs> yeah, it's built into this particular, uh, the Pi Voyager. And so it will store the, the correct date and time, and, and, uh, and you can call on that or set it um, just using this command. Um, you've got the I, I squared C watchdog. You've got the GPIO. You've got uh, timers to wake it up. You've got alarms to wake it up. If you want to wake it up your Raspberry Pi every day at 10 a.m., you can do that. Huh. If you want to shut it down, but automatically reboot it after 25 seconds or five minutes or whatever you want to do, you can add that and the Pi Voyager will take care of it for you. Wow. So look through these commands. Look through um, the um, documentation as well. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find a boatload of information uh, on omslow.com. Of course, pick up a Pi Voyager at cat5.tv slash Pi Voyager if you want. And uh, it is just fantastic. But it is, as I mentioned at the top mm -hmm. of this, mm -hmm. it's less expensive than the competing Raspberry Pi UPSs, wow. but has a boatload of features and because yeah. it oh, can, yeah. because it can communicate back to Bosch or whatever uh, Linux language you're using you mm -hmm. can you can program it to do whatever you want mm -hmm. it's exciting. with regards to the, your power yeah. and stuff so um, fantastic product once again from Omslo uh, and and definitely check those out and and submit your PRs I'd love to see what examples you come up with oh, totally. in order to make this work for uh, for your environment I can only imagine actually yeah. some cool stuff out there already <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be, it's the, I, I'm just blown away by, uh, I, I love this kind of stuff. I love yeah. being able to yeah. tinker and create. And it's so, because these boards are available at such a, a exceptional mm -hmm. price point, um, you're able to get started and, and tinker and, and play around. And hey, make your Raspberry Pi yeah. a heck of a lot better by adding an RTC and oh, battery yeah. backup and all of the watchdog features and everything else. And then you don't have to buy SD cards in bulk any longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. And burn through them. Oh. Right. Well, we've got to head over to the newsroom. So, Sasha, if you are ready. I am. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Robbie called it last week when he said we may start to see legitimate companies moving content onto the dark web in light of recent government sanctions. Well, now BBC News announced it has launched a dark web tour mirror of its news service. The Bloodhound supersonic car has completed its first drive across the Haskin Dry Lake in South Africa. Two reports published in the last few months show that malware operators are experimenting with using wave audio files to hide malicious code. And Google built an advanced computer that has achieved quantum supremacy for the first time, surpassing the performance of conventional devices. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, and here are the top stories we're following this week. Robbie called it last week when he said we may start to see legitimate companies moving content onto the dark web in light of recent government sanctions. Well, now BBC News announced it has launched a dark web tour mirror of its news service. The Tor browser is privacy-focused software used to access the dark web. The browser can obscure who is using it and what data is being accessed, which could help people avoid government surveillance and censorship. In the BBC's case, it comes about as countries including China, Iran, and Vietnam have tried to block their citizens from accessing the BBC News website or programs. Instead of visiting bbc.co.uk slash news or bbc.com slash news, users of the Tor browser can visit the new BBC News 
S News V two V J T P S YU dot onion website. Visiting this web address will not work in a regular web browser. The dark web copy of the BBC news website will be the international edition, as seen from outside the UK. It will include foreign language services such as BBC Arabic, BBC Persian, and BBC Russian. But UK-only content and services such as BBC iPlayer will not be accessible due to broadcast rights. So, you were right! There you go. Whoa, yeah. where did Robbie go? Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was right. <laughs> <laughs> Happy uh, Halloween! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you absolutely called it. Called it. Yeah. So and this will happen with more, uh, more websites and more. I mm. think so. Yes. Yeah. This is just uh, the the first of many. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think it's a great step in the right direction. Oh yeah. Especially for journalism, right? Because you have um, companies like CBC. They give directions to if you want to report something, like mm -hmm. as a secret. Um, they, they instruct you how to do tour, but to have that directly linked in, to have their own site, that's, that's pretty cool. Yes. So The way I see it is right now the dark web has a very dark aura to it. Right. People think yeah. of the dark web as hackers, right. malicious stuff pornography and and various things that you know guns and yeah. drugs explosions that's the dark web yes yeah so let's get some legitimate services on the dark web mm -hmm. to demonstrate that this is a powerful technology yeah. that can be used for good yeah they should have called it something else it shouldn't have been called the dark web it makes it sound scary and shady they should have called it like the alternate web it's the tour alternate. yeah it's, it's just, onion it just tour yeah. onion onion yeah what if you don't like onions? <laughs> just tomato. I love this. I, I love it, and I think that mm -hmm. we'll see a huge shift toward that in, in the next few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what happens is, is governments uh, creating sanctions to say, hey, we're no longer going to do allow business mm -hmm. from United States to Venezuela. Right. Well, now, with Adobe cutting off access to Venezuelan customers yeah. who have already paid exactly mm -hmm. the dark web is the correct answer exactly mm -hmm. and BBC already sees that yeah way to go BBC good job guys I gotta push buttons here yeah. I'll probably lose the mask for the rest of the oh, show no. <laughs> but just so those of you who are watching yeah just okay. all in good fun well, for happy Halloween. Halloween yeah yeah <laughs> it's kind of a good thing we don't have an HR department <laughs> <laughs> yeah The Bloodhound supersonic car has completed its first drive across the Haskine Dry Lake in South Africa. Pilot Andy Green took the jet-powered vehicle on a gentle 100 mile per hour shakedown test run on Friday. Bloodhound is in Northern Cape for high-speed trials as it works towards an assault on the land speed record next year. That mark of 763 miles per hour was set 22 years ago, also by Andy Green, in the Thrust SSC car. Thrust broke the sound barrier in the process, the first and only car to have achieved the feat. Bloodhound will be, will be run at progressively faster and faster speeds in the coming days as engineers seek to verify its design and the proper working of its subsystems. With the Eurofighter jet engine on board, it should be capable of reaching 500 to 600 miles per hour this year. The addition of a rocket motor in 2020 ought to then take the car over 800 miles per hour. Engineers will be looking in particular at how much drag Bloodhound is producing in these trials. This will determine the level of thrust that they will need from the rocket. They will also be checking that the parachutes and brakes can bring the car safely to a stop at the end of a high-speed run. Up to a dozen runs are planned between now and mid-November, with the first six taking the speed up in steps of 50 miles per hour. That's wow. astonishing and I'm, scary. I'm just gonna. I'm I, losing I my just head. Wonder, I wonder. Like I, I understand that, hmm. like the desire to do this, but then, I mean, Andy Green's already done it. Like I feel like. Oh, he, he's, he's got to go it. faster. Now he's doing it gotta again. Go like, come on, 1,200 kilometers an hour. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering because, like, it, it's cool to say, yeah, fastest car, but I'm just wondering, what's the practical use of this? Like, is there any way that scientists are like, yeah. we need a fast car? I mean, like, I would definitely...
take this to work? Like, if I got to work in, like, 10 minutes, that'd be <laughs> awesome. But To be honest, I think it'll just be the design. Well, because they're going to be checking to see what causes drag, they'll probably use that in designs for other vehicles, not land-based vehicles. Are you thinking Mars? Perhaps. Maybe. Right? Mars car. <laughs> <Not with> the, <laughs> sorry. I just... I think it's just our need for speed. It's like the fast. humans, like, we have to progress. Mm -hmm. We have to invent. We have to get better and better right. all the time. I yeah. know. And now, I can understand the need to have parachutes and such to slow down after the speed run. Oh, yeah. But yeah. if it's anything scary. goes wrong during the speed run, there is no mm -hmm. way to correct from oh, that. No. So I hope that they're putting Andy this as won't much attention. Know. He nope. wouldn't know. He would not know. <laughs> no. And that scares me. Like, I'm, I am not a risk taker. I'm not a like thrill. When it, yeah. yeah. Well, I like Says thrills. the guy who started his own web show. Yeah, but that's <laughs> that's a that's a totally different kind of thing. That's like, not yeah, life but if the cars were your thing, like traveling at a th like 800 miles an hour. Oh, it's nothing. <laughs> space shuttle <laughs> does that. Unless you're in yeah, if you're in space, sure, <laughs> but on land in the desert with wheels as you're <laughs> keeping you on the ground, uh, not for me. I I can imagine the feeling would be incredible. Incredible. I yes. don't ever want to feel it, but I bet you it would be awesome. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there you go. Okay, we have to take a quick break. The Crypto Report and more of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. get into the crypto report for this week as we look back at the past seven days of cryptocurrency um, and as we record this on October 30th 2019 this is how things look so Bitcoin is a big gainer this week like Ooh. we're talking over seventeen hundred dollars per coin wow. in gain I should have bought so one. it's sitting so at nine thousand one hundred ninety six sixty nine US dollars Facebook Libra still not trading mm -hmm. uh, we also have Litecoin gaining $9.06 at $58.21. Uh, Ethereum also going up $183.48, up $23 and change from just last week. Wow. And uh, Monero up at uh, $58.72, gaining $6.12. And for a coin that's only worth $58, bucks, a gain of $6 is quite a, a return. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, then we've got the very small micro coins like Scala at 0 0.26 ten thousandths of a cent. Um, and in fact, TurtleCoin is tied <gasps> at that same value. Really? So oh. at 0 0.26 ten thousandths of a cent, but TurtleCoin being a bigger gainer because last week it was mm. point. Uh, zero one ten thousandths of a cent down from Scala, mm -hmm. and I'm not really sure where Scala is going. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen some problems with that coin because of the fact that they've lost, like they they, they had um, their name was a trademark of someone else, right. so they uh, renamed okay. the coin, and then and this was originally Stellite, and then they renamed it Torque, and then Which oh well that's our trademark. Oh over. okay, so now there's <laughs> Scala, and so it's like okay this causes a real like this is the only predictable thing is that that causes a, a loss of confidence in the coin yeah right. and people don't really know what's what and we've got to install new miners and we've got to learn the new codes and the new the new symbols mm -hmm. and uh and so i'm not really sure where it's going but i yeah. do see turtle coin slightly rising slow yes. and steady there and you, you never know i mean over time people will forget those frequent name changes as long as it doesn't continue if it sticks yeah. it out yeah. yeah and if it sticks out like okay let's stick with scala let's say okay that's <laughs> that's what we are yes not to spend too much time on a micro coin but the micro coins are really interesting because they're mm. so incredibly cheap like we're talking oh, yeah. 0 0.26 10 thousandths of a cent per coin yeah right so for me they're far more accessible like i'll joke and say should have bought a bitcoin but really yeah, yeah. i mean i mm -hmm. i'm far more likely to mine turtle coin than i am well you can mine turtle coin yes. with consumer gear yeah. so you don't need an asic you don't need uh, a server farm full of no. gpus no you just need a, a standard computer and you can mine potentially thousands upon thousands of turtle coin mm -hmm. there you go with standard hardware because there's still a lot of supply and they're really really cheap yes huh. so now that said uh as we always warn on the crypto report here at category 5.tv remember that the cryptocurrency market is always changing now we talk about bitcoin is a big gainer this week mm-hmm 
Next week, it could go way down. So, I mean, we've seen it happen. I mean, Bitcoin yeah. was like $20,000 plus dollars per coin. And then we're now, like last week, we were down at 7000 Yeah. So anyone who invested when it was 19 lost big time. Mm -hmm. A lot. So, and I say that to warn you that it's a, incredibly volatile because mm -hmm. the market never closes. Yeah. It's 24-7 mm -hmm. and it can just go either direction at any point. So my recommendation, if you're going to invest, if you're going to uh, crypto mine or whatever you're going to do to be involved mm -hmm. in cryptocurrency is only spend what you can afford to lose. That's the only safe way to be involved in the crypto market. Mm -hmm. um, Sasha, I'm going to throw it back to you for our news stories this week. Excellent. Two reports published in the last few months show that malware operators are experimenting with using wave audio files to hide malicious code. The technique is known as stenography, the art of hiding information in plain sight in another data medium. In the software field, stenography, also referred to as stego, is used to describe the process of hiding files or a text in another file of a different format. For example, hiding plain text inside an image's binary format. Using stenography has been popular with malware operators for more than a decade. Malware authors don't use stenography to breach or infect systems, but rather as a transfer method. Stenography allows files hiding malicious code to bypass security software that whitelists non-executable file formats, such as multimedia files. All previous instances where malware used stenography revolved around using image file formats such as ping or JPEG. The novelty in the, new, in the two recently published reports is the use of wave audio files not seen abused in malware operations until this year. The first of these two new malware campaigns abusing wave files was reported back in June, semantic security researchers said they spotted a Russian cyber espionage group known as Waterbug, or Turla, using WAV files to hide and transfer malicious code from their server to already infected victims. The second malware campaign was spotted this month by BlackBerry Silence. But while the semantic report described a nation-state cyber espionage operation, Silence said they saw the wave stenography technique being abused in a run-of-the-mill crypto mining malware operation. Silence said this particular threat actor was hiding DLLs inside wave audio files. Malware already present on the infected host would download and read the wave file, extract the DLL bit by bit, and then run it, installing a cryptocurrency miner application named XMR Rig. This shows that your mundane crypto mining malware authors are growing in sophistication as they learn from other operations. <laughs> wow. Mm. So. Well, that's hard. That's a hard one, right? Because if you go to a website and they have normal WAV file, yeah, yeah, there you go, and you can't stop that. Like unless if you want to block mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, how would you ever? Well, that's it. See you it. can't. You can't block WAV files and JPEGs and bitmaps yeah, just, and pings it's and. Just, it'll be all yeah. like 1995 yeah. basic HTML <laughs> sites, right? Like it's it's getting yeah. weird. Like They're it's how do you block sneaky. this? And but remember that stenography cannot infect your system. What can mm -hmm. is that. If you have an app that is then able to decode mm -hmm. the hidden files within the stenographic file, mm -hmm. okay. that's where you run a problem. So how can that be a problem? If you, let's say you deal with um, pirated software, okay. it's quite likely that they would inject some form of ability to open stenographic data. So yeah. for example, let's say you have Photoshop that's an illegal copy. Uh, well, you're going to open JPEG files or exactly. or yeah. maybe you've got a, a, a wave editor or you know something like Just something. And so you open the wave file with that editor and yeah. suddenly you're infected. Um, that's just one example, but mm. it could come from apps. Like yeah. apps could enter the app store that are advertising by, themselves yeah. as, hey, here's a wave player for your phone, right? right. Yeah. And if you're not very careful of the file, like the apps that mm -hmm. you install and where you get them from, uh, okay. then that can pose a problem too. Yeah, it just takes one, right? Yeah, <sighs> but you have to, it, it has to have that decoder mm -hmm. right. in place in order to be able to open the data that is hidden. Otherwise, I mean, you open one of those, <laughs> those files, the wave files, and it will play the audio normally. Right. You, you'll be able to edit it in Gold Wave normally or Audacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you have an app that reads the hidden data, 
that's, that's where, when you're in trouble. Yeah. I mm-hmm. just feel like these malicious players, they're just like one little step ahead, right? So you just, yeah. you build yourself up and you get comfortable with your security and they're like, yeah. Haha, did you think of that? No. <laughs> oh, no. Wow, oh, boy. Yeah. And that's tough because antivirus can't stop that. Yeah. yeah. And so it really comes back down to be smart. Yes. Be careful. Mm -hmm. and realize that there are social engineering tactics out there to trick Mm -hmm. you into installing the app that they want you to open the WAV file with. Yeah. Or or the JPEG or whatever it is. So, yeah. I know. It would be be so easy to slip into that without having the foresight to question it. Yeah. So, thank you. Be careful, folks. Google built an advanced computer that has achieved quantum supremacy for the first time, surpassing the performance of conventional devices. Scientists have been working on quantum computers for decades because they, co- they promise much faster speeds. Now that speed has been realized and it's mind-blowing. Their Sycamore quantum processor was able to perform a specific task in 200 seconds. Now get ready for this. That same task would take the world's best supercomputer 10,000 years to complete. Oh, yeah. In geez. classical computers, the unit of information is called a bit, and it can have a value of either one or zero. But it's equivalent in a quantum system, the qubit, short for quantum bit, can be both one and zero at the same time. This phenomenon opens the door for multiple calculations to be performed simultaneously. But the qubits need to be synchronized using a quantum effect known as entanglement, which Albert Einstein termed spooky action at a distance. However, scientists have struggled to build working devices with enough qubits to make them competitive with conventional types of computer. The word quantum computer is a little bit misleading because it sounds like a computer. And when people think of computer, they think of a phone or a laptop. The truth is the phone and the laptop and even a very powerful supercomputer all operate according to the same fundamental rules. And a quantum computer is fundamentally different. The classical bit stores information as a zero or one, and a quantum bit can be both zero and one at the same time. If you have two quantum bits, then there are four possible states that you can put in superposition. With three qubits, it's eight, four qubits, it's 16, but grows exponentially. The nice thing about quantum supremacy is that this is a very well-defined engineering milestone. In a nutshell, what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that experimental quantum computers can surpass the best supercomputers in the world. To actually demonstrate quantum supremacy, we have these three steps. First, pick a circuit. Second, run it on the quantum computer. Third, simulate what the quantum computer is doing on a classical computer. We gradually increase the complexity of that circuit. At some point, it becomes completely impossible for the classical computer to keep up then we say we've achieved quantum supremacy. Sycamore contains 54 qubits, although one of them didn't work during the test, so the device ran on 53 qubits. Professor Professor Jonathan Oppenheim from UCL, who was not involved with the latest study, says, quote, it's an interesting test. It shows that they have a lot of control over their device It shows that they have low error rates, but it's nowhere near the kind of precision we would need to have a full-scale quantum computer, end quote. IBM, which has been working on quantum computers of its own, questioned some of Google's figures saying, quote, this is in fact a conservative worst case estimate, and we expect that with additional refinements of the classical cost of the simulation can be reduced, can be further reduced, end quote. IBM also quells some of the excitement saying, quote, quantum computers will never reign supreme over classical computers, <laughs> but will rather work in concert with them since they each have their unique strengths, end quote. That said, this is a very exciting leap in quantum computing and is destined to lead to some incredible calculations being performed in seconds rather than millennia. <laughs> wow. How sore losery are the other <laughs> Oh my gosh. It kind of comes across that yeah. way. It's not that good. <laughs> oh my it's gosh. 200 so, seconds? Meh. It's all, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. We, yeah. could, we could have done it in 400. 
It's cool. Yeah. It's cool. I ju- you know what? The part that, this is why I can never be a, like a quantum computing scientist programmer. Oh, this is I don't why, understand. folks. Listen up. This is I why. I don't understand how something can be one and zero at the both at the same time in binary. <laughs> because like, you're either one or zero. How can physics, you be Sasha? Both? Physics. As Albert yeah. Einstein said, it's spooky. Yeah, it entangles yeah. my brain. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, uh, it, we're seeing such a shift in technology, and, and mm-hmm. it is pushing to, towards something new. And, and what could that be used for? I look at NPU, and NPU, n- neural processing units, mm-hmm. blow my mind. Right. And IBM yes. is correct. Like an NPU, is, it's not a replacement for a CPU. It's mm-hmm. something that supplements it. So usually when you have an NPU, you also have a CPU. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it does other things, and it does them really, really fast. So yeah. when I encode video, I use uh, an MPEG encoder card because my c- it will do it faster than my CPU. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that's, or, or you think about crypto mining with an ASIC. Well, you're using an ASIC specifically to crypto mine at a faster rate. Mm-hmm. Right. So when they find that, hey, what can this really be used for? The and use it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. The sweet That's mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what, our passwords aren't safe anymore. Oh, no. You know? Oh, no, they aren't. Now. Like, like brute Solve forces. It. Brute forces that uh, you, typically a, a computer would not be able to brute yep. force our password in 100,000 years mm. can be done in seconds. Yeah. Yeah, but now with security get better as well because security could also go through quantum computing. Can cryptography oh. go through quantum computing, or is that where the blockchain and and quantum computing and neural processing all come together yes. <laughs> and say, you know, in your face, IBM? Oh my gosh! Right. But that like it's a, it's like a constant. It's like a leapfrog, it is. right? Yeah. Like we have to create cryptocurrency in order to create crypto. Crypt- cryptography Cryptography. that is blockchain based and secure yeah and then the new processors come out quantum computing that can now well reverse all that you just got to think how this is going to impact everyday life though because if you go back in time when computers are first like starting up you know you have the binary system but now what are cell phones and all these other if we still have them what are they going to be like in 50 years from now yeah and if it becomes mainstream right like Mm -hmm. sure now it seems oh it's almost impossible you need so much power but back then we look when servers took up like an entire level of a building even Mm -hmm. think of the 1980s yes (laughs) i was not alive think of it though for those of us who were (laughs) and think about like this right okay and think about the computers that we had and and now think about the the fastest computer in the world at that time. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it's not as fast as what you have in front of you right there. The computer from War Games. That was a good movie. And we keep pushing <laughs> we keep pushing the boundary. We, I mean, this isn't the only story with it. We had the Bloodhound car, and now we mm-hmm. have these, yeah. you know, it, it's it's human nature. We are always going to try and just grasp at the next thing. We have to. And Ours. we will. Yeah. And we'll get there. Ours. I love it. Yeah, it's nice. mind blowing. Hey, what can it be used for? Let us know yeah. down below. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Henry Bailey Brown. Thanks for being here with us, everybody. We've got to take a really quick break. Stick around. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Hey, I appreciate everybody being here with us this week. It's been a lot of fun, and I hope that you had a happy and safe Halloween. Um, Listen, next week, we've got a great show planned. We've looked at a handful of Bluetooth headphones in the past. Yes. But we've never really had the opportunity to say which headphones sound best of Mm -hmm. all the ones that we've looked at. And so not only are we going to do that, but we've added a couple more to the mix. So we've got a fantastic assortment of Bluetooth headphones that are available right now. uh, And uh, we're going to be comparing them. It's a tough thing to review 
but it's a good opportunity for us to share with you what we think. So our opinion as to which ones are the most comfortable, which ones sound the best, which ones give the most awesome bass, and uh, and all of those kinds of opinion pieces about Bluetooth headphones. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're in the market for them, or if you've got anyone on your uh, on your Christmas shopping list uh, that is uh, looking for headphones, we're going to be checking out a good assortment of Bluetooth headphones next week. Um, to those of you who are affected by the California fires, just want to say we really do hope that you are safe and uh, and that your you and your families are well. Uh, we did miss um, some of our California viewers this week, and uh, and it doesn't go unnoticed. And uh, we do appreciate you and hope that you are well um for the rest of you hey been great having you here and uh hope everybody has a fantastic week thanks to these two as well see you next week bye-bye